But this morning I would like us to start this message by me sharing something that happened to me while I was in school. I can't remember exactly when. I think it was earlier high school somewhere and I saw this thing on TV and they were speaking about this person who um, was starting to travel because they wanted to find themselves. And the thought came to mind, like, why, why am I hearing so much about people sort of upping and leaving, you know, later in their life trying to find themselves? Now I think about people who are middle-aged and they want to buy a sports car and they want to do this and that. And we all know the memes and we all know the cliches. Um, on that note, I do actually know a friend who decided to buy his sports car early in his life, in his, in his early 30s. Um, and he decided, okay, listen, he's going to do this now. But then he sold it very quickly, and then he realized why people buy it late in life. Because he didn't want to go anywhere without his kids, but now he's got this two-seater Porsche, and every time he wants to go anywhere, he needs to arrange for his kids, and it's a struggle. And you sort of realize that sometimes there's a reason for a cliche. But I digress. Anyway, back to the message. Remember, serious faces. And um, I was thinking about this, and I keep on, I don't know, throughout my life, this thought has sort of come up again, and I keep kept on thinking about people who want to find themselves. And sometimes in my life, I've, I've thought about it as well. Um, for some of you, maybe it, it's not the case. But I've realized that there, there are times in my life where I have realized, now bear with me here, don't run ahead of me. There's times in my life where I've realized how limited life is. I've realized that there are certain avenues that I will never be able to take anymore because of choices that I've made. Now, I want to stress, I'm not upset or regretting any of the paths that I've made, but I realized because I now have a wife and very soon two children, the idea of van life and building myself a van and driving across the country by my lonesome, that's not so much a reality unless, God forbid, something would happen. You understand where I'm going with this? So there's certain avenues in my life that I won't be able to experience or realize how this might feel. I don't, I, there's very little chance that I'll be able to experience university life and being able to study full-time at an actual u university. Because throughout my life, I've studied online. That's, that's what I've done. I've, I've worked and I've, I've woken up early or, or worked late at night, and that's how I've done my studying. It is not the funnest way, but it, it gets things done. So there's certain times in my life where I've realized the limitedness of life, and it's then when you start to realize... Sure, I need to start making good choices because I really want to make sure that I make the best choice. And this is very, over, very often overwhelming because you don't know what choices you have left. And, and it's not because you're getting into frantic, but you, you realize, you think about life. Now, with that mindset, I just quickly want to give that guidance because very often that's what we try and do. And I think that there's very often value in that because we need to realize that the choices we make have long-term effects, and that's a good thing. But I think very often how we approach it in trying to find ourselves in, you know, who I really want to be is not the right question. And today we're talking about that and looking at Luke 9 now. Just as sort of context of where we've been, we've seen Luke describing who Jesus was and, and describing him as this person who went for the person who was, who was lost, he came and he had compassion. And the way that he very often did things, the way that he did miracles was very often in a questionable way. I've, I've mentioned this before and I feel it needs repeating. In the Afrikaans we say aspris. Very often the way that he would do something would be on purpose to sort of conflict in people's lives. To do things in a certain way that makes you think and wonder. and Like, oh, why would you do it that way? But yet when we think about our own lives, very often we have this expectation that he's going to do things by the book and everything's going to go straight forward. Last week we spoke about how Jesus took his disciples to a... That's the speaker. It switched off. Now all of you are awake. So we will find a way to address that problem in the future. So as Jesus went to the private place, apparently there was a car and a line at the same time. In any case... Um, for those of you who need to go to the loo, it's down over there. Okay. Now, back to seriousness. So Jesus took his disciples to a private place, and then only about 15,000 people followed them up into this mountain where they had to feed them. And we see this conflict, and we spoke about how sometimes in your life you just want that privacy. And 
you don't always get it. You have this idea of where you want to go or this avenue that you want to take, but very often it feels like things are not working in that same manner. That's what we discussed last week. This week, for some reason, we see this in this nonchalant, very easy way. Jesus was able to have some privacy. As he was alone praying, his disciples were with him. So it's semi-privacy. Now, what I want to mention with that before I actually get into the rest of the verse is we need to realize that us being alone in Jesus' terms very often meant making sure that you still had your faithful companions with you. May that be our version of alone. May our version of alone not be, I'm sitting by my lonesome, there's no one around me, there's no one I'm able to talk to. Now, there's a time and a place for that, that's fine. I'm not saying that no one should be alone, but what I'm saying is we should be in unity in, in a family when we're alone. But now, carrying on. So Jesus was alone praying, and he asked them. Now, by the way, I, just, I, I see this sort of scene unfolding, them being in this sort of quiet, private place. And Jesus is praying, and as he's praying, them doing stuff over there, also supposed to be praying, but they're probably playing rock, papers, and scissors, or sleeping, as we see later on in the Bible. They just, they don't really get it. But Jesus is praying, and then I feel like he gets this prompt from the Holy Spirit or, or God the Father, just saying him, ask him, ask him this. And I just see Jesus saying, who do the people say that I am? And now the people are answering. It's easy because now they can say what the people are skinnering. So the people are saying, you're John the Baptist. The people are saying some, but some say Elijah. And others say one of the old prophets has ridden. Oh, sorry, has risen, not ridden. So people are saying that he's John the Baptist and he's this guy. And people are trying to figure out, because remember, they don't have pictures, they don't have Facebook. So everyone's sort of confused about these stories that are circulating. And no one's really sure about who this person is. But then Jesus asked the most important question that you will ever ask in your life. But he said to them, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. I want to pause there for a moment because I feel that we need to realize the importance of this question. People can say what they want, but what Jesus is concerned about is who do you say he is? Is Jesus a miracle worker? Is Jesus a nice guy? Is he God Almighty? Is he God the Savior? That's fine. According to, to Peter here, he's Christ. He's the Christ of God, meaning he's the long-awaited Messiah. Now, for those of you who are not completely sure about what that meant, because very often we think Christ is Jesus' surname, that's not. Christ means he's the coming Messiah. When we say Jesus Christ, it means Jesus, our Savior, that we have been waiting for. Because in the Old Testament, we see God creating everything. Humanity messes up through Adam and Eve. They made choices because they thought that they could make a choice, and their choice would be better than God's. And because of that... They sort of excluded themselves from God's authority in their life. And because of that, everything went pear-shaped from there. But then God made a promise to them, and he made it to Abraham and to David, and, and to so many people after that, to the point where people are like, oh, he's never going to come. But he made a promise to them that through your family line, I'm going to send someone who is going to bless the entire world. But what the Jews did, they took that promise and they isolated to themselves. They had this perception that the coming Messiah would be, as we see in very often in some of the Old Testament prophecies, he would be the person to reunite the kingdom, to save them, to help them feel wonderful, and to, to rule them, and they, they would have no enemies. And the Jews would have this perception at that stage, contextually, remember, the Jews were under Roman authority. So in their context, they were waiting for this person to come and overthrow Rome and chase Rome away so that they can set up their kingdom and Jesus would be the new King David. Which in a sense is true because they would, Jesus is sort of the, the King David, but he's, he's not. And this is why Jesus does the following, because this is very confusing. And Jesus strictly commanded them to tell no one of this. Remember, they just said that Jesus is the coming Messiah. This is true. Now, very often I've wondered to myself, and the question has been posed, and I think for the first time ever I realized why Jesus said, don't tell anyone. I think all of us have asked this at some stage or another. Why would Jesus tell some people, okay, it's fine, go tell people, and for other people, be quiet. He's, he's chosen 12, shh, just keep it amongst yourself. 
Now, I believe that there's two sort of main reasons for it. Number one, I don't think that the time was there for people to understand this. But also because I think Peter, despite the fact that this looks wonderful, I don't think that he had the right understanding of what it meant. And then Jesus continued by saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things. According to Peter's contextual understanding, using big words, but what he thought at that stage was Jesus was the coming person who was going to overthrow Rome and everything's going to be united in this world and everything's going to be perfect. But this is the moment when Jesus tries to make as clear as possible, not speaking in parables, being completely clear. The Son of Man, referring to himself because of a prophecy from Daniel. I know it feels confusing. It's, it's not. So Jesus must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. How more clear can you get it? He says, don't tell people, but I need you to understand this. This is what I need you to understand. Because the message that you're going to be proclaiming is not correct. You mean well. And this is why I want to scooch over to Marcus for a moment and a wonderful thing what we very often do is we we look at the Bible and we get confused about certain things and I want to sort of carry on for a moment when you read something some of your Bibles have like underneath the heading or something there's passages that show or refer to other passages that tell the same story from a different author or refer to the same topic if you have one of those Use those things.
essentially. They call it the transfiguration just so that people can sound all biblical instead of just transforming or changing. But he becomes this beaming light with Moses and Elijah just having conversation like old friends. And yet these three are able to see it and they're astounded by what they're able to see. And that's the kingdom of God, essentially seeing Jesus in his full glory, seeing him with his full authority. They had a glimpse of what that kingdom was. At one stage I was thinking, no, but maybe it was the crucifixion. Because when Jesus died, that was also the coming kingdom. But then we need to realign ourselves with what it actually means when we talk about the kingdom of God. On the one hand, yes, it's the coming kingdom where we're in the end of days and we see Jesus' kingdom rise down and the new Jerusalem and, and Satan slain and everything's beautiful and that's perfect. That is the kingdom of God. But yet Jesus also talks about the kingdom of God being present in our life today. And yet Jesus also speaks about the kingdom of God being inside of us. These are not things put there to confuse us. These are all true realities. And I think that it's important for us to realize what he was speaking about. If you continue reading this transfiguration story, he reads then, and then there's this beautiful moment, and then God Almighty speaks and then says, this is my son. Just once again saying, listen, this is him. And then suddenly everyone disappears, or, or Moses and Elijah disappears. And the reason I don't want to focus on this is because that just emphasizes the point of who Jesus is. But now I want to sort of bring this message to a semi-slow close in stating and asking you the question, who is Jesus in your life? Is he the person that requires me to stop doing certain things? Is he the person that I go to so that I can name it and claim it and say I want success and health and happiness and all of this? Or is he what I believe he's trying to make clear with this point and saying, whatever life you put me in, whatever situation you put me in, I accept it. Whether it is you want me to go through a crucifixion, whether it is you want me to be dispersed as we see with the early church. I mean, the reason Christianity spread was because they were persecuted. Everybody was building this big community as we see in Acts 2, 3, all the way to 6. We see this big community forming and it's wonderful. But yet they were failing to do what Jesus instructed them. Go out. So how does Jesus get us to actually do his will? Very often he allows things. So then they were chased out. They were being persecuted. And then just because God's ironic in that way, he gets the guy who was persecuting them the most to join the ranks. Paul. Friends, this morning, I want to call myself, but all of us out. So that we can reevaluate who Jesus is in our life. You see, because who Jesus is in our life determines how we live. Two weeks ago, we spoke about the person who was possessed by the thousands of demons called Legion. And I mentioned that that demon wasn't saved despite the fact that he proclaimed that Jesus is the Son of God. The person that's venue we're using next week is a Muslim. He believes Jesus is a wonderful person. He believes he's a prophet. He believes he's great. But sadly, according to our understanding of what Jesus said, he's not saved. Which I want to encourage us all, as a church, let's pray for his salvation. Because God is able currently to use a Muslim to invite us into his house. So that we can glorify who we believe Jesus is. You have Jehovah's Witnesses who believe that Jesus was created and was the first created being. It's not true. Jesus is God. He has always been and He will always be because God is three but yet He's one. I want to encourage us in this time to reevaluate who Jesus is in our life. Let us take all of our ambition and our thoughts and put it aside because Peter wanted Jesus to live. He had the best intention in the world. In your life, you might have the best intention in the world to glorify God through a certain way. Is that the way that Jesus wants to be glorified? 
currently God is laying something in your heart that maybe might not make sense. Tough. Follow through. And I mean this in the most loving way. Because if you look at the crucifixion, that looks horrible. You see Jesus dying. You see him going through pain and suffering. But yet through that, God worked the most wonderful miracle in the world. He saved us through what we did not understand. I've mentioned that before in sort of closing. The book of Romans was written because Paul, with the best intention in the world, wanted to go to a group of Christians, but yet he was... He was hindered to go there. And because he couldn't go despite his good intentions, we now have the book of Romans that actually gives us so much understanding of our Christian faith. As we go through life, let's look at our interruptions. Let's look at our ambitions and let's lay them down before Christ. If something goes wrong, God, how do you want me to deal with it? If something goes right, God, is this the way that you wanted this to happen? Let's just allow life to happen because only through that we can live through Jesus' saying of seek God's kingdom first and every day take every challenge according to His will. Whenever you don't know what to do, think about what might bring God glory, pay attention and listen and God will lay something on your heart. I truly believe it. And if He's quiet, do what you feel best according to His will because that's why we have the Holy Spirit. That's why we have logic. But let's realign ourselves this week with what we believe Jesus truly is in our lives. Let's close our eyes and pray. Dear Lord, I want to say thank you so much for this message. Thank you so much for your love, Lord. Thank you for this word. And I want to beg you with everything in me, open our hearts to who you truly, to who you truly are, Lord. I ask that you hold us tightly, Lord. Lead us and allow us to live our lives according to your will, Lord. That you're not the person who just came to give us what we think that we need, Lord. Think about Peter, who was a, had this expectation that Jesus would come and save the nation, and that's wonderful, Lord. But you had so much bigger news, so much bigger ambitions for him, Lord. I pray that you please guide us and lead us in our life, Lord. Show us who you truly are.